Hello. Our story starts pinned down in your trenches. Master Us shoved a student to the ground into a trench as a missile sped by and slammed into the cockpit of an ATTE. Titus turned around, seeing the pilot obliterated by the blast. Two clones ran up in front of Titus, yelling out commands to each other. The captain of the 73rd rolled around a tree, firing his blasters away. Another missile went off, blowing three clones away. Cries from medic came ringing out. Titus was holding his lightsaber, breathing heavily. Master Usk ordered the men forward as he stepped out, holding his lightsaber in front of them. One of the clones next to Titus got shot in the chest and flew off of his feet, crying out in agony. Titus snapped back into the moment as the sound of blaster fire and orders sprang out into the air. Titus sheathed his lightsaber and ran over to the clone trooper, asking if he was alright. The clone trooper wrapped his hand around the Jedi commander's hand. Titus told the trooper he would be alright as he slid his arms under the trooper and picked him up, running him over to some cover, and placing him down to make sure he was alright. The clones saw their Jedi commander doing this, and it was incredibly important for them to see how their Jedi leaders were treating them. Titus looked over to where the medic was, as Titus told the medic to step back, calling out across the battlefield. The medic looked over, and Titus used the force to pull the injured clones over to the cover so that they could be safe. Another missile exploded, destroying an ATRT as a metal gear slid down, crushing one of the clones in front of it, instantly killing the trooper. The medic ran over and thanked the commander as he began putting back to onto the injured troopers. Titus ignited his lightsaber and spun it around in his hands as he ran forward to catch up with his master. In front of him, there was an entire droid army. This was the Legion's first battle, and it was the same case for Titus and Master Usk. The clones pushed forward behind their Jedi. More men rounded the corners as another ATTE walked around the destruction of the first one. The droid armies had several AATs, and they were pushing heavily. Usk looked back at his student and told him they needed to go forward and get to the tank. If they didn't get to the tanks, then the army would suffer more losses. Usk told Captain Poison to keep up the assault. The two Jedi were going to help. In front of the heavy Separatist tanks, there were several layers of battle droids. Usk and Titus went into two separate directions and ran forward through the tree line, becoming parallel with the droid forces. Titus and Usk moved stealthily through the trees, and when they got to the task, they cut across the forested area. The droid forces didn't see this coming. Being so early in the war, the tactical droids hadn't yet discovered Jedi strategies. If the Jedi continued their strategy, then the tactical droids would likely analyze it and report it back to CIS database for all the other tactical droids to be able to relay that information out on other battlefields. Regardless, the two Jedi ran forward. Titus climbed a rock formation outside the battle line. As he ascended it, he used his leverage to propel himself into the air. The clones, seeing the Jedi in action for the first time ever, were incredibly impressed and even shocked to see this maneuver. Usk saw his apprentice and so he turned towards the back of the Separatist lines, dragging his lightsaber across the bottom of one of the ATTs, before leaping on top of another one. Titus swung his lightsaber down, cutting through the long barrel on the massive tank. The battle droids all turned around and began to fire at the Jedi apprentice. Titus rolled along the hole of the tank as blaster fire lined up behind him, ricocheting off the massive vehicle. Once Titus was behind it, he used the massive amount of force that he could and pushed it forward. The tank began to move forward and it caught some heat and began picking up speed. The tank began running over the battle droids before the tank itself imploded from the crew inside of the vehicle firing the long barreled cannon. The entire tank wiped out an entire grouping of battle droids. Titus turned away from the droids, watching his incredible master go to work. Usk was standing on the last tank in the division of droids, using the force to pull the tactical droid out of the tank and slicing the droid into pieces. The clone troopers of the 73rd ran forward blasting away. Titus saw his master had everything covered, and so he went back to help the men. Cutting and slashing away the battle droids caught between the groupings of clones and the very skilled Jedi apprentice. It was an absolute victory. The Republic captured the planet from the Separatists and now could enjoy the pleasures of victory. Captain Poison came up to the Jedi commander and patted him on the shoulder, jokingly telling him that next time he wanted to have just as much fun and should consider inviting him to join the party next time. Titus smiled as the two of them started walking towards the Jedi general. Master Usk was walking out of the wreckage, surrounded by flames and hellfire. This was a victory, but something the Jedi Master pondered is what all this senseless destruction would do for the Jedi Order. Before Usk could say anything, he was hailed in by Captain Nereus of the fleet above. The captain told him that there was a Separatist fleet emerging from hyperspace. The clones needed to evacuate before the droid bombers were sent to the ground. Captain Nereus told the general that there would be fighter escorts sent down with their gunships, telling them to prepare for immediate evac. Titus heard the message and turned around yelling out commands before his master could say a word. The clones listened immediately. Something Titus didn't struggle with was confidence in the arena of battle. Some Jedi struggled with this kind of discipline and even attitude, but Titus felt like he was born to be here. Maybe not in the front lines of combat, but in the commanding position. It was his father's legacy living through him. Janus being the individual he was, lived on through his children. In space, the Separatist fleet arrived. The fleet was much larger than the Republic fleet, which didn't have the supplies to hold out. They needed to get the troops 
troops inside of their vessel immediately. If they didn't, then they would lose the entire fleet and the ground troops would be stuck. Gunships rained down from the skies as V-19s flew down from the skies, providing air cover. They were all in the clear. The clones loaded up into their gunships. Us and Titus helped out all the wounded and made sure they got into the gunships as the LAT doors closed and the vessels departed back to the fleet. The fleet itself was struggling. Captain Nereus moved support vessels away from the front lines. The Light Republic cruisers were no match for Separatist warships. Captain Nereus noticed a wave of hyena bombers flooding the skies. He knew that the fleet was out of position. With the fleet turning away and the hangar bays being left clear for the returning gunships, he couldn't do anything to block the path, which meant the fleet was defenseless. The gunships got into space as Flak began to shake the gunships from side to side. One of the gunships exploded. From in front of the gunships, a wing of V-19 fighters flew through the Flak, turning away from the Republic fleet and cutting through the hyena bombers. The LAATs got closer to the fleet and swung down into the hangar bays while the massive ships were turning around. The V-19s were ordered back by Captain Nereus, which they were already on their way back because they did the covering fire they were supposed to do. They were being trailed, but it was of no use to the Separatists. Captain Nereus masterfully got his entire fleet away from Seleucami before it was destroyed. The issue was that there was a terrific victory on the ground, but now that was essentially useless because they ended up retreating from the planet anyways. Captain Nereus apologized to the Jedi General, but Master Usk understood. It wasn't his fault. The Republic had been dealing with a number of early war losses, some of them costing the lives entire Balians. The Battle of Minban, and so far the campaign on Artrakan, was going terribly. The campaign started not so long after the Battle of Genosis, but it wasn't exactly what the Jedi were hoping for in terms of results for such a campaign. It was costing the Republic a lot, and the troops on the ground were suffering. Though truthfully, Master Usk would rather not go to Artrakan anytime soon. Across the galaxy on the planet, of Dantooine, Luna sat on a small platform with her eyes closed. She was taking in the force itself. Her master was leading the effort to secure everything from the former Jedi Temple and Outpost here. The Jedi really left artifacts here because they were of no use to anyone that couldn't use the force. But with the war heating up, they didn't want someone like Dooku getting his hands on the information, and even though he likely knew what the information was, it wasn't something they wanted anyone to be taught. These were ancient secrets of the force that the Jedi had kept hidden for millennia. It was all part of their goal to undermine the control and the aspects of the force, and they believed that they shouldn't be used. Master Kron noticed her apprentice's lack of interest in any of this. To an extent, she understood, but she also didn't appreciate how her student handled such adversity. In Dara's mind, Luna should be, while well, yes, at odds if she didn't agree with it, it would be better for Luna if she buckled down and worked along with everyone because that was what was being asked of her to do. It would be respectful to say the least, to just abide by what everyone was doing, to work with everyone to get to know the clones at the very least. It would be better than sulking. Though Luna wasn't sulking, she was meditating. She found a peaceful spot and again galaxy full of carnage, and she could feel where her brother was. She felt things that had already passed, and so Luna was feeling the presence of the battle that her brother had just left. She could hear the clones crying out in agony and issuing orders. In all honesty, it was quite disturbing for someone her age to hear. Being 13 and thrusted into a war wasn't an easy task, but Luna had hoped that with the individual she was training under, that she wouldn't see the front lines of combat. Jara wasn't stationed with a large group of clones, so for them to engage in combat would essentially be the end of them, especially since Jara wasn't exactly the warring type of Jedi Master. She was really calm and collected about everything, and she spent most of her time engaging in diplomacy and getting children from families across the galaxy. That was her trade, and while she said she would be fine serving in the war, she never believed she would be placed into active duty. It was simply a message to her Jedi leaders that she was willing to go the distance if needed. No one really knew, but all Jara wanted was to be a member of the Jedi Council. That was really her goal, and it was much of what she wanted as a Jedi. Of course, protect the galaxy and take care of people, but her own ambitions outweighed her actions, and the Council saw that, which is why she never was offered a seat on the High Council. There was a point after the Battle of Genosis where she was up for debate, but Master Shock T was much more deserving of the candidate for position. Plus, Shock T was a better fit for Kamino than Jera would ever be. While Jera thought that no one knew this, Luna knew this about her master, which is something Jera never knew that Luna was aware of. Luna knew a lot. It was in her quiet nature as an observer to know. She could tell stuff about people, which would explain her distaste for a given number of individuals. It was all through her reliance on the Force, but Luna's high midichlorian count could have been so much more of a gift to her. She was tough for Jara, and there was obvious tension, so obvious that many of the clones picked up on it. The tension that existed between Master and Apprentice was from Jara's inclination to believe that she was worthy of being on the High Council. Luna knew she wasn't worthy of it, and so did many others. But the ambitious drive for what many would call power crippled her. It also made it so that Jara struggled to teach Luna. They got along well for the most part, but that's because Luna didn't want to spring out that zesty, egomaniac of a Jedi that her master was. Luna listened well, and she was always open to learning, but some people turned her off. 
Most of the instructors in the temple did that, and Jara did the same. So with so much raw potential, she suffered because of the Jedi and their inability to capitalize off of it. At heart, Jara wanted to be the best instructor she could be for Luna, but her lust for greatness evaded her at times, and it left a wound early in the relationship as master and apprentice. In a moment like this, where Luna was by herself, it would be better for Jara to approach Luna than act if she didn't exist. Regardless, Master Usk and his fleet arrived at a hyperspace over the Wookiee homeworld of Kashyyyk. It was pretty much a straight shot from Seleucami, and it was protected space, so they were fine there. Master Usk and Titus were standing on the bridge, listening to the Jedi Masters of the High Council discuss their plans for the assault, a next assault that is. Many Jedi listened to these debriefings, though they didn't get the talk. The main people who got the talk were the council members and the chancellor. Every so often, those who weren't council members got to speak, but typically, that was just the chosen one. The rest of the Masters were encouraged to listen to these calls because the council members were redirecting fleets around the galaxy. With the recent victory over Christophsis and the security of their Outer Rim trade routes, granted by Jabba the Hutt, the Republic had a path forward towards trying to end this war. Considering Grandmaster Yoda just returned from bringing Toydaria into the Republic, and on the other hand, the Separatists were getting ready, especially considering Grandmaster Yoda had just returned from bringing Toydaria into the Republic. On the other hand, the Separatists were getting especially testy. This was seen with the disappearance of Republic fleets throughout the core. Jedi Master Plo Koon was sent to the Abrogado system to locate what was causing this great distress. There was also word that the Separatists were preparing to mount up an assault on the planet of Ryloth, but the Republic couldn't afford any troops to go out there in this particular time. On the other hand, one of the main council members were dismissed. Windu addressed the rest of the Jedi dispatching various groups of Jedi Masters to different locations. Master Usk and Titus were being sent to Manda, which was in the Rishi Maids. The reason for being sent here was because there had been word that the Separatists were trying to backdoor Kamino through the Rishi Maze, and they simply couldn't allow that to happen. So right after the battle, they were getting ready for another. This is what it would be like, what war would do to them. Titus was hoping that the men could get some rest and more time to recover from the whole battle of Seleucami, but they were soldiers now, all of them. They all had a duty to fulfill and a war to win. So in retrospect, Titus figured that he should have seen this coming. But he never realized how bad the war had really gotten up until this point. Captain Nearest prepared a fleet and they jumped into hyperspace. Inside of the Messina system, it had been formerly 10 planetary rotations, and the Separatist tactical droids deployed to the surface to see if the people of Earth came to a conclusion. Though the tactical droids realized how primitive the planet really was at this point in their development, most of the civilizations began to idolize the tactical droids as being sent by the gods. Numerous civilizations believed that it was a message from the deities above to become a part of something greater. Though, as many people typically do, they saw this sign as a threat, and so they believed they would be better off without the influence or the protection of the Separatists. There was something much larger than the brightest minds of the time could comprehend, and that was their struggle. They could not simply come to terms with a coalition of individuals of which they did not know or support. This went across the planet. Of course, there were those that did think they should join the Separatists, but in republics such as Rome, they were outvoted by their colleagues to deliberately stay out of this galactic conflict that apparently existed. Once the tactical droid got this information, he related to Count Dooku. The leader of the Separatists took in the knowledge that he was given and immediately sent the tactical droid General Locke. Dirt. There was a reason for all of this. Outside of Manda, the Republic fleet arrived with Master Usk and Titus. Everything was going fine. There wasn't a sign of anybody or anything. The irony of going out into the Rishi Maze is that there was already an outpost on the Rishi Moon to alert the Republic if the Separatists were making a move for the cloning facilities on Kamino. With this small fleet present at the mouth of the Rishi Maze, it essentially made it an overkill to say the least. The whole point of this operation here in the Rishi Maze was to alert the Republic, and with a fleet here, now, that kind of got rid of the whole point of the station. Didn't matter much anyways, there were only like six or seven clones on that station. Regardless, Titus and us were standing on the bridge talking to each other. Their relationship was really strong, and they very infrequently had struggles. Usk was always a good master to Titus, and that was the point, at least in Usk's mind. He believed that the point of being a teacher revolved around bettering his student. It was his own philosophy towards being a Jedi Master, and it clearly wasn't a shared belief around the entire temple. Usk and Titus talked about the war itself. Titus told his master that he worried about the men. They were his biggest concern. Usk appreciated that his student had such a care for the troops. It wasn't largely talked about, but to a wise master like us, it was obvious that the men appreciated it. The men could communicate with their brothers elsewhere in the galaxy, and even Usk overheard that not all the Jedi were the easiest generals to be around, some of them hiding behind their men and not even participating in battles. 
There was one Jedi Master who was already making clones nervous about serving under him or even getting close to a sector near him. His name was Master Pong Krell. Usk admitted that he wasn't overly fond of Krell anyways, but that was because their species never really got along with Trandosians. Not to mention Krell and Usk were a part of the same class, the two of them always vying for the best student of the class. Inevitably, Krell was the winner of that competition. It's not that he didn't have the respect because Krell was rather respected within the Jedi Order and the Temple, it's just he was a bit tough to deal with. He made Quinlan Voss look easy to be around. He made Qui-Gon look easy to be around. Tedis understood. And so, the point that Usk was trying to make is that caring for the men was an essential part of being a general during the Clone War. If he didn't care for them, then they wouldn't care for him as well. There was a necessary bond between the two of them, generals and troopers, that is. Usk continued and expressed to his student that he was very proud of how far Titus had come since they started training together. Titus was a little worrisome for a short period of time. He was always a bit timid in terms of just about everything, but he developed into a soon-to-be fine Jedi night. Tedis looked over at his master. Usk smiled at his student. He sincerely meant it. Plus, it wasn't common for Usk to joke around like that and throw his student for a loop. He was being honest. He was ready to let go of his student. Though it would be up to Titus if he wanted to continue serving with the 73rd or to join another grouping of clone troopers. While Titus wasn't supposed to have such emotions, he genuinely cared for all of his men. But that was what came along with serving alongside someone in active combat. It produced an unexplainable bond of brotherhood. It meant that the clones and their Jedi commander were now brothers. It was the same for many Jedi across the galaxy, like Cody and Kenobi, Rex and Skywalker. Jedi that took to the trenches with their men were respected as if they were cloned on Kamino as well. Of course, a bit different with all those other abilities and their lightsabers, but it was a band of brothers, a bond that was inseparable during combat. Usk asked his student how he was handling the war. Usk knew it wasn't common for Jedi to talk about their feelings, but he knew how important it was for his student especially to talk about how the war affected him thus far. The first battle they were in was rough. It was a culture shock to say the least. For the moment, Titus expressed he was alright with it, and that for the most part, Active Comet didn't bother him too much. However, he couldn't sleep. When he heard and watched his brethren get slaughtered by mindless droids, it haunted him. It was so wrong, and it never should have come to this. In the mid-rim, the Jedi Temple on Dantooine was emptied out and the clones and the Jedi were ready to depart. They only had a fleet of three Republic light cruisers, but that shouldn't be that big of a deal. The only issue is, it was. The Jedi were moving from Dantooine to the core, but stopped at Ithor to jump onto a different hyperspace route on the Carnelian Spur, which would take them into Nimbodia Corridor and then from there straight shot to Coruscant. When they arrived outside of Ithor, chaos broke out. They were ambushed by a fleet of Separatist frigates. This wasn't even a planned ambush. The fleet just happened to be relocating so that they could go to Mygido, which was a little bit away from the location. When the three Republic cruisers came out of hyperspace, the captain of the fleet panicked. He told the ships to put all power to the shields as he tried to redirect the ships away from the Separatist fleet. When he moved the ships away from the Separatists, the flagship's engine compartment was ruptured and stalled out. The captain ordered the remaining vessels to reach out for reinforcements. They would hold out as long as they could. In his panic, the captain ordered everyone to the escape pods, to which Master Jar told him not to. He asked why, as she explained that the Separatists were likely going to board his ship. If they abandoned the ship, they became easy targets. They didn't want that. So, they would instead wait until they were boarded. It would give them a chance to first of all survive, and second of all, wait out the Separatists until reinforcements arrived. It was a better plan than sitting on Ithor, hoping that the Separatists wouldn't ruin your day by landing a division of troops and tanks to wipe you off the face of the galaxy. So, they waited, and waited, until the Separatists docked. There were about 200 troops inside this vessel. It was the most outfitted ship in the three that arrived, and so they waited. Two Jedi, 200 clones, and one way out. When the Separatists boarded, they entered without any struggles. This was entirely intentional. Jera knew that if the droids faced stiff resistance upon boarding, they would cut off the cord and then obliterate the ship, especially with no engines to escape with. So the crew hid along several corridors and allowed the droids to pass by. The B1s were tasked with going to the bridge to capture the survivors. And as the droids marched through the halls of the ship, they met zero resistance. On the other hand, the two Jedi led the 200 clones across the boarding capsule into the Separatist frigate. Jared told the clones to fan out into several squads to keep together and stay as quiet as possible. Her and Luna were going to go to the bridge and take down the tactical droid leading this mission. Jarrah looked at her student and told her that they got this, as long as they stuck together. The clones all fanned out across the ship. The main job was to take down as many droids as they could to make their escape easier. 
Because the droids on the light cruiser reported nothing, the droids disconnected the vessel and blew it up, leaving the remnants of the cruiser behind. Eventually, Jar and Luna would find themselves on the bridge of the frigate, and without staying quiet, they ignited their lightsabers and made quick work of the essentially defenseless piloting droids and the engineers on the bridge. The tactical droid was taken out, and Jara issued out an order to all the clones across the vessel that the bridge was taken. Jara then used her code to transmit a message to the Republic, a fleet station in the mid-rim, letting them know that they had full control over the flagship of the fleet station on Ithor. They would be ready, awaiting the reinforcements. Inside the Messina system, on the polar opposite side of the galaxy, a landing party exited. General Locke Durd was sent here to test out some special weapons gifted to him by the Separatists. All across the planet, these specialized weapons would be tested on the numerous civilized cultures in the world. World. This would include down the Yellow River, on the Far East Hemisphere, to the Mediterranean, down the Nile as well. There were so many fun locations to choose and Locke Durd couldn't help but enjoy every moment. He released a series of defiliator deployment tanks into multiple areas of the Italian peninsula. Across the Nile River, a grouping of new B-2 battle droids were released. These were flight equipped and they were being tested out on these people. Across the Nile, another line of all-terrain tanks were being tested out and on the western side of the hemisphere, the prototype CIS droid HMP gunship was being tested out. Locke Durd watched an array of screens all across the planet as the largest populations across the planet fought back. To a maniac like Locke Durd, it was remarkable. The DDD was tested out in several locations. Fire rained down from the skies and the people were massacred. There were those brave enough to stand up to the invaders, but they were all quelled. Bows and spears were no match for battle droids with superior technology. Over Ithor, Luna fell to the floor, grasping at her heart. The strings of pain were torn across every fiber of her body as she felt the people of Earth suffer. She could feel the genocide happen. And there was nothing she could do about it but feel it. The overwhelming coldness of this dark moment devoured Earth. Lockdurd was testing out on Earth because the Republic didn't know about it, and aside from the Jedi brought to the Jedi Temple from Earth, no one knew about it. The entire planet was off the grid from the galaxy, and Dooku was saving it for this moment. Had the people of Earth joined his coalition, only half of them would have suffered. Once Lockdurd was done, the Zygerians were brought in, and they took the survivors back to Zygeria for enslavement. Luna couldn't escape her pain. Over Amanda, Titus grabbed his master's shoulder. Usk asked what was wrong, to which Titus told him that the people from his home world had just suffered. Usk was curious as to what this could possibly feasibly mean, but there was no need for explanation. Titus told his master that the Separatists likely went to Earth for what he didn't know but was a mass execution. The people were slaughtered, and as for Aurelia and Janus, they weren't given a chance when the DDT fired around from across the Messina Strait and it crushed the beautiful city in the ruins. Titus handled his loss rather well. He of course wasn't happy about losing his home planet, but he was a Jedi. He couldn't do anything in the moment. His mandate was to be right here, right now. If he had a chance to return, he would, but that wasn't right now. He had a duty to fulfill. Usk respected his students' maturity. Master Usk understood this. His people were fighting against the Republic, kinda in their own way. So he understood, though his people more or less went to the highest bidder. And because Kashyyyk was under Republic jurisdiction, the Trandoshans naturally moved their sights towards the Separatists. Though Titus's sister didn't have the same quick resolve as her older brother did. Tears fell from her eyes as she bent over on the ground. One of the clones ran up to her and asked if she was okay. Luna shook her head. The clone called for a medic, to which Luna told him that a medic wouldn't fix this. Jaren knelt down and asked her student what happened. Luna told her master that her home world was just ravaged by the Separatist. Well, maybe it was pirates, but, but not even pirates in the Outer Rim would do something so heinous. Jara, after realizing what it was, told Luna that it was time to let go of the past, and that included her home world. The clone trooper looked up at the Jedi Master and then looked down at the young Jedi. He put his hand out to help her up. Luna grabbed the clone's hand and she used it to get up, but as she used her grip to get up, she tightened it harder and harder. The clone didn't say a word, but it hurt for sure, but he could understand why the young girl was flustered or even frustrated. She just looked at her master and said while grinding her teeth a painful yes master before turning away from her and walking towards the front of the bridge they were on. The clone looked at the two Jedi before turning back toward the door. He was thankful he had a mask on because that confrontation was painful to bear. He felt bad for the kid. She just lost her home world, and the last thing the Jedi could do was even give her a hug or something or anything. But the Jedi told her to move on. In fairness to Jar, she was just following the code, but even she had to know that it was cruel behavior. Luna was by no means typically emotional, not by Anakin standards at the very least, but the pain she felt, she felt because of what happened. The Force on Earth transmitted those terrible feelings of suffering, pain, and death through her very soul, and being so young, she was unequipped to handle that amount of extreme loss. 
Titus didn't react the same way. He was more trained to be a Jedi, to be stronger, to be more mentally tough. It was a Jedi way not to be blinded by attachments. And so, that's what Titus did. Shortly after the incident on the Separatist Bridge, the Republic fleet arrived at a hyperspace over Ithor and a space battle began. The Separatist fleet without the guidance of the tactical droid ran a conflicted panic as the droid commanders tried to gather together to fight off the Republic forces, but there was nothing they could do. When the droid forces were routed from Ithor, a landing party of LAATs made their way for the Separatist flagship. The clones and the Jedi were currently making their way for the hangar bay so that they could be rescued. However, this was still a droid vessel and there were still thousands of droids out and about. The clones made a push down the corridors, with the Jedi leading. As they kept pushing, the clone who helped Luna up was crushed by a B2 list rocket. Luna turned around and cried out, running to the trooper's side. He was long dead. The clones passed by her, blasting the B2 down as Jara kept going without noticing her student missing. Another one of the clones came over to Luna and told her it was time to go. She couldn't do anything to save him. He was gone. Luna looked at the other clones as she stood up. He knew it was probably against protocol, but he put his hand out to her and told her that he had her back as long as she had his. Luna nodded her head and she grabbed the trooper's hand as the two of them caught up to the rest of the troops. When they got into the hangar bay, Jara got into the gunship first with a handful of men. Luna was on the last transport out. She was the last one in, and when the doors closed, she sank to the floor of the vessel. The clones around her asked if she was alright, seeing if there was anything they could do for her, but she couldn't muster the words to say anything, just telling them that it was the price of war. The clones all understood this, though none of them having lost any brothers until today's skirmish, being that none of them were ever on the front lines, they understood that the price of war was their lives. The price of all of this was their brothers, their family, and Commander Luna just became a part of that family. They all saw how the Jedi General treated her, and they didn't like it or agree with it. But Jar was a Jedi, is what she was supposed to teach her student. Maybe not so malignantly, but that's what she was supposed to teach her student. When the gunships landed inside the Republic flagship, Jara came around the corner and asked where her student went. Luna said she tripped, looking down at the ground and then back to her master. Jara told Luna that she had a lot to learn about being a Jedi. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is part four of our story. Special thanks to Gallivant Gaming, White Lightning, Tristan, Darth Revan, Pimp Daddy Bane, The Last Jedi, Apollo, Jedi Sloth, Mad Nanny Studios, Anakin 003, Lemon Knight, Rex the Wolf, The Man with Three First Names, Dark Saint 46, and Lord Deadwing for supporting the channel. This series is heating up. Keep staying tuned. It's only gonna get darker. I love you all, spread the love, and always remember my friends, may the force be with you.